Thank you all for joining us tonight. And I want to thank Jonathan for that introduction. And as he mentioned, um, the idea for this talk was really Jonathan's. He saw a story I wrote on the adventuring about the Medusa, and he suggested transforming it into a conversation. Now, most jewels cannot be transformed into a conversation. <laughs> But the Medusa is really the exception, and here we are. And it's such a pleasure to be here at the 92nd Street Y, especially during New York City Jewelry Week, which has become such an incredible platform thanks to the um, amazing work of the founders, JB and Bella, who I hope are here tonight. <laughs> Yay! From, uh, <laughs> I've got one. <laughs> If you get one of the two founders during New York City Jewelry Week, you really, you've won already. So that's great. And of course, most of all, I am just, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here with Nani and Christopher, who are going to share their extraordinary knowledge about Louis Comfort Tiffany and their new research about the Medusa. Now let's see if I can make the tech work. We're rolling. When you are doing a talk with someone who does the visuals for Tiffany, you end up with things like this. Nani and I concur, this is unlike anything we have ever had in a conversation before. Because this is a CGI of the Medusa, its relevance to history and scholarship will become clear as we move along in this conversation. Um, from the moment the Medusa was debuted in Louis Comfort Tiffany's first collection of jewelry in 1904 at the Louisiana Purchase Exposition. It was among 27 jewels. It has always been a subject of fascination. More recently, people wondered, where is it? Because it was missing. From the time until recently, until about three years ago, no one knew where this jewel was since it was sold from the original owners, the family of the original owners, in 1943. But people, nevertheless, people learned about the jewel from this colorized historical photograph. It was published in the artwork of Louis, Louis C. Tiffany. This book, uh, was published in 1914, and Mr. Tiffany put it together as a kind of compilation of career highlights. It was also, this image was republished in several contemporary um, books and articles, and when I wrote about it for the adventuring, people told me, um, you know, a dealer and a collector, they said they thought about it all the time. They wondered where it was. They wondered if it was still intact to use the parlance of our times, it was their Roman Empire. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to just, as a first top line question, I wanted to ask both of you, before you got your hands on the piece, what did you think about it? Well, I, I have to say, thank you, Marion. It, it was kind of the holy grail for Tiffany. And, and I'm one of those people who, who fantasized that we would find this and who, who, who I mean, I, I published it twice. Every lecture I gave on Tiffany, I showed a slide of it in order to hear back from somebody in the audience to say, oh, it's in my closet, it's in my <laughs> safe deposit box. And that didn't happen. Um, but, but it has this extraordinary aura. It's one of the earliest pieces that Tiffany made. It's experimental. It, um, it's evocative, it's abstracted, it could be considered grotesque, almost symbolist. It has so many things going on in it. Christopher? Oh. <laughs> well, I, the thing I love about the piece is that it encompasses a kind of dangerous beauty. And I, I think that there's something so, so wild about it. It, it. Once you connect with that center stone, even in a publication, um, there's something much deeper that, that drew me to the piece. Well, when it did emerge, because we all know now, it, it has reemerged in 2021 
at auction at Sotheby's. It was the magnificent jewelry auction. And, you know, as, as somebody said to me, suddenly there it was. And the pre sale estimate was $100,000 to $200,000. That was smashed <laughs> rapidly. It went into a bidding war. It, among three parties for 10 minutes, and when the hammer finally came down, it sold for $3,650,000, which you know, was living up to expectation, really, of the way people felt about the jewel. At the time the hammer came down, it was the most expensive piece of Louis Comfort Tiffany sold publicly. Since then, a lamp or two might have jumped ahead of that figure, but it, it's a pretty impressive sum. So before we move into the Medusa, I just want to walk back a little bit with the career of Louis Comfort Tiffany, because I found it fascinating that he did not design jewelry until he was 54 years old, and he officially joined Tiffany & Company, which was in 1902. It was the year his father died, the founder of the firm, Charles Louis Tiffany. At this time, he was already a famous artist. Nani, I know this is your life's well, work, <laughs> but... <laughs> How much you... time do you all have? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, well, Louis, Louis Tiffany had a very long career. It was a, about five decades long career, starting in the 1880s, and catapulted to fame because in three years after he started a decorating firm, he was decorating the White House. So it gives you a sense of that immediate, um, that immediate fame and he went and one of the things that's so extraordinary about him is the ex the amazing number of media in which this artist worked and I don't think there's a, another artist who can claim that so you have here um, a stained glass window we know he did interiors he worked and it's just notice quickly the magnolias because that's a, a wonderful image I mean wonderful motif that he used in many different media you saw it in the window here in the leaded sh glass shade of a floor lamp. And on the right, a, a wonderful enamel, um, which, which he didn't start until the 1890s. So not, it, it was important that he was doing enamels then because he used that in much of the jewelry that he would start making just a few years later. Yeah, and even though he didn't um, work at Tiffany proper, so to speak, until 1902, mm -hmm. if I can get the slides to work. There we go. He, he was supported by his father, and can you illuminate that a little bit, Christopher? Absolutely, so of course, um, you know, perhaps there was an expectation that Louis C. Tiffany would join the family business, I, I, I don't know. Even today, um, I don't know, you know, not every parent, encourages education in the arts. Sometimes that's not what uh, you know, a super successful father would have in mind for their son. But Charles T Tiffany absolutely uh, supported his son's creative pursuits, uh, certainly with his education. I love this image. It shows um, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Charles uh, Louis Tiffany in, in the studio of, of, of their son, Louis C. Tiffany. And to me, I love this image because it, it reminds me a little bit of my parents, right? Like these, these parents proud of their punk rock son. You know, and there's a lot of pride you see and they're sitting on this polar bear throw and there's this crazy glass thing behind them and they are beaming with pride. So it's also worth noting that the blue book, the, uh, this is the annual book that Tiffany, Tiffany introduced, Tiffany and Company introduced the first mail order catalog in the United States in 1845. And even to today, we still are very active in offering incredible jewels in blue book. In the 1901 blue book, we see even the Favrile glass lamps appear. I mean, so Tiffany and Company is selling the incredible works that is coming out of Tiffany Studios. I think that what an incredible sign of support from your father. And didn't the, uh, Tiffany and uh, Louis Comfort Tiffany also exhibit side by side in the exposition? That's right, in the World's Fairs, there would be a side by side display. Um, and in some cases, we'll see where the jewelry is inside the display. So, um, we're gonna look at a couple of jewels that uh, Louis Comfort Tiffany made before we move on to the Medusa to show in contrast and in context of how, how they were 
how the Medusa is so very different from the other pieces, and also how he kind of pulled from the, the lamps and things like that. And of course, one of the great masterpieces, we're looking at the dragonfly lamp, is, is yours at the Met. Um, Nani, can Not you? Not that. That's mine. <laughs> Not that one, sorry. <laughs> Not that. <laughs> Driving by the lamp right here, but that's a visual, and here, this one. <laughs> um, well, it does, it does show you that, that his that nature was his muse in many different variety, floral. We all think of the flowers, but, but insects and, as you'll see, sea creatures as well. Um, but this is, this is one of the most, this and the Medusa, I would say, are two of the most extraordinary survivals of the early work of Louis Tiffany. It's almost a sculptural work. It's two dandelion puffs, one of which is miraculously partially blown away, and two dragonflies on it. And I, I think one of the appeals about these motifs is very, very common um, image of a, of a plant that's actually gone by is the ephemeral idea of this. The dragonfly, which lasts for a second on any perch, and the dandelion puff, which disappears in the wind. It's really such a beautiful piece. And this one comes from the collection of Louise Havemeyer. Um, this, this was originally owned by Louisine Havemeyer, who, who was probably, she and her husband were probably the most important private pa patrons of Tiffany's work. And this just followed um, with the decoration of their house on, in New York. And it's a, this has got a wonderful story for another lecture of how this turned, turned up, but it, was, it remained in that family until it was given to the Met. Now I want to know the story, but I will move on. <laughs> That's amazing. And some of the techniques that are in this piece are, um, if I can move the slides. It's a sticky slide. There we go. Um, Christopher, yeah. can you tell us a little bit about what we're looking at here with I the mean, wings? I mean, it's extraordinary. You know, you can see the attention, the lifelike attention to detail. What I love about the piece is the use of platinum, which, of course, platinum is is a new material at this time, and you're looking at platinum without gemstones, without diamonds, without even, you know, it, it's, he's allowing the platinum to just exist in honor of that material. To me, that's such an artistic treatment and, and honor of that noble material, platinum, when you compare it to what other people were doing at that time, even Tiffany and Company, you know, under uh, Paulding Farnham, we were doing extraordinary work such as this beautiful uh, piece, which we, uh, which is prob probably about 1900. This was uh, from the Wade family, and it shows how, of course, the use of platinum changed the idea of a diamond necklace, but, you know, this is what we were selling at that time, and you imagine the wonderful, marvelous works that, that Louis T C. Tiffany is creating at that time. What an expressive contrast. Absolutely. And um, this is another one of his, I'm sorry, my clicker wants to be sticky. There we go. Oh. And this is another one of your jewels at the Met, Nani. This is a Queen Anne's lace, which is just exceptional. Well, I think it's a marvelous contrast with the Paulding Farnham piece because Tiffany and company was using these fantastic gemstones but Tiffany wanted to use semi-precious stones and enamel in much of the early jewelry that he made. And this is one of those examples that was exhibited at the 1904 fair of Queen Anne's, um, of Queen Anne's lace, yes, which, which is quite remarkable. It's, it's little tiny florets of white enamel and interspersed each, each umbel is what it's called, each little one has a... Um, um, a demantoid garnet as its center, or, or several. And then in the middle, it has three garnets, three red garnets. My mother used to always say, when, I when we picked Queen Anne's lace, that the, that the dark center was the blood of Queen Anne. I think Louis Tiffany might have, might have known something about that. In any event, it, these, are, these are roadside flowers. And, and the one thing I'll, I'll say about this is, it, because I think it expresses his interest in nature in all of its forms, he exhibited three Queen Anne's lace hair ornaments at the fair. 
and each one was in a different stage of bloom. So just a bud emerging a little bit further where you know, it has sort of a flat top, and this dome top, which was at the full, full bloom of the flower. It's amazing. And so then we can see as we move on here, Oh, we have this as well. Do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> well, we couldn't, slide. Help it. we couldn't help but put this one in because this is a completely different um, expression by Louis Tiffany of the Queen Anne Slay. So the, this is from the music room of Louisine and H.O. Havemeyer at, at 1 East 66th Street in New York, sadly gone. But the music room had this almost kinetic lighting fixture of Queen Anne's Lace, which... Louisine recalled when she saw it for the first time, she exclaimed, Tiffany, the wild carrot, another name for Queen Anne's Lace. It, it looks like you've just gathered these blooms. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not quoting it just right, but, but it had this extraordinarily naturalistic appearance. Yeah, in, in high contrast, I think, to what we're looking at tonight with the Medusa, which is so artistic and it's expressive and it's not realistic. And what is he looking at and doing here? Um, this, is, this is truly a breathtaking piece, as you can see in this wonderful image of it. Um, so this is a Medu the Medusa, is what it was called at the time when it was exhibited in 1904. So it's actually the only piece that was given a title, which is quite interesting. You all might have thought when you heard about the Medusa, you were going to see a face with tendrils of hair. But the Medusa is actually referring to the stage in, in the jellyfish where it's actually kind of going, that I'm, I don't have the right word for it, but anyway, with, and so the long, long tendrils. And, and so the central sort of amorphic stone gives you a sense of that jellyfish with the gold um, tendrils evoking the tendrils of the jellyfish itself. And these these wonderful golden coils relate very closely to a, stone, a stained glass window panel, the border of which is, are, are coils very similar to this, but much, but about a decade earlier. Um, and and this, even the sort of sensuous details at the corners relate, I think, to this as well. And you see here, the center is, a, is an abstract Squ yellow, uh, orange squash, you can see the squash blossom and the tendrils of a squash plant. This is seen through transmitted light. But when you see it with reflected light, you see a jellyfish. The squash blossoms are gone. The palette is a sea, watery, watery environment with this fantastically abstracted jellyfish whose tendrils are actually ribbons of molten glass that are just sort of frozen in time. It, it's, there's nothing, there's really nothing quite like it. Amazing, so we know that he was looking at, I actually had this image from Earth Cycles uh, book, Art Forms in Nature, in my story, in the Adventurine, and um, I was guessing, to be honest, that he probably had a copy of this book because we know that um, Lalique used this book. There was such a connection between art and science at the turn of the century. It was really the rise of the museums of natural history, and I learned uh, today. Nani tells me we know he did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, this, was, this was in the, um, the auction for his estate, um, actually, from, from for Laurelton Hall, he had already died, which had his entire library, and and I was just fascinated to see that Heckel, that um, the volume of Heckel was in his collection as well. Yeah, he, an interesting biologist who really focused on jellyfish. That was it. <laughs> he was very romantic about yeah, it. Yeah, but at the same time, we're we're also looking at abstractions. Yes. Right. So we're looking at uh, you know he had also Japanese wood prints. He had Japanese wallpaper. Some of those we have in our in our archives, uh, you know, he's looking at multiple sources of inspiration because it's not a naturalistic expression, much like the the window we just saw. You know, what I love about that piece when 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 you walked me down into the wing and showed me 
that window, I can't help but think about the active expression of pouring that glass to make that jellyfish shape. And there's something so incredibly expressive about the Medusa pendant as well. I mean, you, you can't help but get into the hands of the craftsman or the craftsperson who's making the piece. But I, you know, I can't help but think that non-Western images were also used as, as inspiration. Um, certainly not specifically this one, but we know that he did have Japanese wood prints uh, and he supplied his designers with them as well. Exactly, because it, he didn't make the jellyfish in the, in the manner in which he did the dragonflies and the magnificent dandelions. He could have. I mean, he absolutely could have. <laughs> and it could have been done in moonstone like everybody else does. But, uh, and, and we know he loved working in Moonstone. Exactly, but, but a little bit later than this. Yeah, 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 so, but he didn't, but he didn't do it, you know? No. He, he did something completely different. I know I'm getting ahead. No, you're not, <laughs> no, you're not. I'm just, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna move you ahead though because I know you can give us more information about gems. And this is actually a page from um, Louis Comfort Tiffany. When he uh, started at Tiffany, he established something called the Art jewelry department. You feel like he always was focused on making sure the creative was uppermost. And this is a detail page from um, Tiffany's Art Jewelry Department, Volume 1, Book 2. <laughs> and it shows the entry for the Medusa. And can you interpret this for us, Interpret it. I yes. Mean... <laughs> interpret the numbers, the inventory numbers, and tell us what we're learning from just the little bit of information we have next to the photograph. Well, at Tiffany, we have an incredible archives, I have to say. And uh, the team uh, has done an incredible job researching this piece. This is one of the volumes in our collection. Um, Maura Ferguson, who I believe is here, is our um, assistant curator. And um, she's done an incredible job uh, diving deep into the story of this piece and unearthing details that, that no one knew. But the, the J references uh, Julia Munson, who we know, uh, she was an enamel artist that, that had worked with him and that he brought in to uh, partner and to collaborate on on these little missionaries of art. And the idea of uh, the J is, a, is, we believe, is a reference that, that she had a hand in this as well. Um, also, we see that it's written Medusa, right? We knew it had a title because it's written there. That's not, so, you know, one of us didn't put a spin on it. That, you know, we know that that is, that it, it, well, it's an artwork because it has a title. I mean, the fact that it had a title, I think, is very important. Also, it lists the gemstones, as mysterious as they are. Um, you know, it lists them because, uh, you know, all we had was this black and white photo or the, the tinted version later to, to understand. And I, do you mind if I just jump in quickly about Julia Munson? I think it's really important to recognize her contribution to this piece. And, and I think it also helps us to understand how significant and yet how little known um, is, the, is the role of women in much of the art of Louis Comfort Tiffany. Um, Julia Munson was a, was a superb enamel, enamelist, which Tiffany recognized, and, and her craftsmanship is, is quite extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, I know we're, but think about those those wings we saw before, those beautiful dragonfly wings, how easy would it have been to make those enamel, knowing he had her you know, available, or that it could have been um, plique au jour very easily, but he didn't. You know, he, he, it was artistic restraint in many ways. He was using the platinum artistically. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's extraordinary. Right. And then, so this is where the two of you have taken, gone into the lab, and you have discovered, you have treated this like a masterwork of art that it is. I mean, we see this happening with paintings when they get x-rayed, they take the Vermeer in and they find out what he did and what somebody else did, what the additions are. But you both have worked on this piece and discovered all kinds of things. And what does an x-ray tell us about well, the Medusa? Let me, I'm just gonna first say it was yeah. how exciting it was to have this brought into the museum and we took it immediately to our objects conservation department. They took it then to the Department of, of um, Scientific Research. So we had a huge team of people looking at this from many, many different ways, even before 
Tiffany and company started to do to do that. Yeah. So the X-ray is I. I it's a view we never saw before, no. right? All we had was that hand-tinted photograph. So it was our first view inside the piece, and um, that was an exciting, like what's that? Dr. Christopher, what are we looking well, at? Well, Dr. Christopher, what are we looking at? <laughs> well, you know, it took, uh, you know, again, you know, we have a wonderful team. Um, at Tiffany, we have something called the Jewelry Design Innovation Workshop, and many of that team are here tonight as well. Thank you. Um, thank you. And they helped us translate the x-ray. I mean, I can't tell, you know. And inside the x-ray, we saw all sorts of amazing worlds, including hinges that had been covered up uh, that we didn't know that would allow the piece to be articulated in a way that we never imagined. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it revealed that they could absolutely <laughs> move, you know. So as the wearer is moving, so would the uh, tendrils of the jellyfish. This is something we would never have known. Um, also, the construction of the piece, and, and we're going to dive a little bit more into the construction because uh, that's where some of the surprises and mysteries began, began to reveal themselves. I have this, I have this CGI. Yes, oh. and it's going to work. There's Here a lot go. of CGI, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and what is this going to tell us? Can you walk us through this? Well, it's really wild. We, um, through the x-ray and through analysis with the um, conservation and science team at the Met, we learned that the stones were not set the way we'd expect them to. There was all this white material on the surface of the piece, and we, we had no idea, when we, even in the auction, we were like, we were asking ourselves, what is that material? And so once we were able to analyze the piece, um, through, through, through Ann Grady, and we'll talk a little bit about Ann Grady at the Met, she was able to identify that material as uh, a zinc phosphate cement, <laughs> which is essential, with a mercury uh, amalgam on top. Essentially, this is dental cement, guys. Yeah. <laughs> so the stones are, I mean, talk about experimental. Uh, it, it truly was. I mean, he, 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 he could have used prongs. He could have, you know, worked with all of the, the very finest jewelry workers at Tiffany & Company to, to put together the nicest construction. Instead, he chooses to do something totally original um, from the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> no. What do you think inspired him to go in this direction with the manufacturing? Well, it's experimental. He didn't want, you know... The only color in the piece is coming from gemstones, and clearly he didn't want to cover the color. And uh, while not all the gemstones are set this way, uh, you know, the fact that this is a, an experiment meant that um, his vision was something that he couldn't, you know, he, he had to follow. I, I don't know how else to describe it. I mean, we're, we're looking at a, a cross-section that shows that these pieces are suspended and that you almost like they're magical. And it, it relates to the work in so many other media that he did. Everything was very experimental, when, particularly when he started out. And I mean, who would, have put, who would have put translucent quartz in a window, for example, like, like the one I showed you or we looked at earlier. But every, whenever he went to a new medium, he tried he tried it in many ways that nobody would have considered prior to, to that work. Amazing. And, and this is, um, we're cleaning. This, this, was, this was in the Mets Conservation Studio. And Ann Grady, our objects conservator of metals and jewelry, um, is here. You can only see her hands and with blue gloves. But here so delicately. The, the piece was pretty dirty when, when, um, when it appeared, and so he or she is extremely delicately cleaning it. So we saw it really for the first time with, uh, you know, the stones came alive, the gold came alive, and, and she really was a spearheader for, for all of the scientific work that was done at the Met. Do we know how long it took to clean? It was, it was filthy. Oh. It really it was. It was filthy. Yeah. <laughs> well, she, and she used, you can see that tiny, tiny little brush, and it's, yeah. um, it's rather painstaking work, but she, she actually loved it. Yeah. 
The, the rumors of its level of cleanliness made it around town, I have to say, when it, was, <laughs> when it was seen at Sotheby's and people said, oh, you're talking about that piece? That piece was so dirty, you know? <laughs> but, but you all fixed it up. We're in the process, you know? It, it's, it's iterative, right? We have many layers of work that we are working together on. It's not like it's a start to finish. I mean, it's an unknown journey, right? Like the first thing we had to do was to clean the piece. Mm -hmm. And once it was cleaned, more became uh, visible to us. And again, this journey we've, you know, we've been on together has been quite exciting because we're, we're there as these discoveries are made. And, and that's why we wanted to share those with you today because there's so much to talk about. So it's really like cleaning a work of art. It is like cleaning a painting. It is a work of art. Yes. yes. But there were things when we saw it, um, we didn't, a lot of the stones couldn't even be identified at the time when it came up for auction, partially because they were so dirty and partially because they were different from anything we had seen. It's so true. I mean, I think this image, it, it was a perfect setup. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So this image uh, I took from my phone, um, Victoria Worth Reynolds, who is our chief gemologist at Tiffany. <laughs> we love. So I invited uh, Victoria to come up, and, and we met with Nani, and, and, and we said, OK, the piece is clean. Let's take a look at it. And so um, she, gets, she has this really special um, flashlight thing with that beams all sorts of laser beams. That's the technical term for it, yeah. flashlight. Yeah. <laughs> fluorescent. Well, this, so it, it does different light, and then she's got this fluorescent click. And she has a bag of tricks. <laughs> so under, under the um, ultraviolet light, it was wild, because the, the pieces that we suspected were corundum uh, were, and, and we see the fluorescent. We, so the pieces, okay, so corundum that's any color but red is sapphire, and red corundum is ruby. So you're seeing the ruby fluoresce, and you're seeing the corundum, the, the sapphire fluoresce, but what's crazy about that sapphire is underneath, it was reacting like an opal. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, how could this possibly be? I mean, it was just... Um... At one time, we thought it was glass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we know it's not glass. <laughs> we know it's not glass. But we did learn what it was, or what we think it might be. <laughs> so I think that's what We're the getting next there. Yeah. Step by step with the Medusa. Medusa is going to remain mysterious for as long as it can, that's for sure. It likes to have its mysteries. And then here we are with another CGI. This one is really artistic. <laughs> so with the um, jewelry design innovation workshop, and uh, we have some wonderful folks on that team, uh, Mary Sanga, we looked at the stone and realized we were looking at a, potentially a triplet. And the way a triplet normally works is that you have a sliver of precious opal, and then you have something transparent on top that magnifies it, that makes it feel like a, essentially like a larger opal. But I'd, we'd never seen a triplet with a precious stone as that <laughs> magnifying element with a slice of precious opal. Under the, the host stone is generally something very dark. Uh, we don't know what if, if that is what we have here, we don't know what that is because we would, we would, we, there's no way of knowing without taking the stone out and we'll never do that. Although it is interesting that in some triplets that base stone can be glass, which I think is fascinating. quite fascinating knowing it's Charles, you know, Louis C. Tiffany. So here we're looking at how that, that triplet, and I have to say possible triplet. We've only looked at one, and on the side of it, you can see where it, there's hints of it. Um, and again, thank you, Victoria Worth Reynolds, for making that journey and helping us with that discovery. That was pretty incredible. And then, in relation to his, to his work that we spoke about before that built his career, this, this jewel links right up. Well, I, I was so fascinated when I learned that this could, could be this triplet um, because it, that's in a, in a totally different medium. That's kind of the thing that 
that he and his, and his workshops were doing with the windows that they made. Oftentimes, you know, it, a stained glass window that you usually think of as flat, one layer. But Tiffany, to get a little change in, in effect, in color, or the like, would plate or sort of stack, um, layer different pieces of glass on top of it and then lead them together. Could be two, could be three, could be as many as five different layers of glass. And I hope you can see it in that kind of striated opalescent glass that's bordering the, the flowers. It's sort of, it's, it's completely at a, at a different depth, which means that the front's the same, but that just shows you the kinds of layers that, that, that he used in many of the stained glass windows that came out of the studios. And, and if I can please add to that, it, one of the effects of it is a sense of atmospheric perspective. So you have things that are in the distance and reading like they're really far back, and then you have things that are clearly up front, right? Well, in that triplet, we're, you know, another thing that, that was discovered, thank you, Vicki, is that um, as we cleaned the stone, the sides of the stone w couldn't get as, you know, that, that fine, we, the top part was beautifully uh, polished, right? Like the most brilliant polish you can imagine. But as you got to the sides of that stone, it was still rather, um, it felt almost like it's etched almost etched, right? Or acid, yeah. yeah, or acid, exactly. It had this sort of um, granular effect. Unlike the top part of those cabochons, we realized that this is, this is Louis Tiffany creating a sense of directional polish, directing the eye into the stone like a pool so that you, you can't experience the whole stone. He's telling you where to look. Well, and, and in fact, that we just acquired a magnificent window and with lots of experimental techniques in the glass, and a number of places have exactly that same effect. It's amazing, and everything that both of you are saying, I think, really leads into this final CGI drama <laughs> at, the, at the end, because um, Louis C. Tiffany signed this piece, Artist. And as far as we know, correct me if I'm wrong, it's the only jewel that he signed artist. But you've both really led up to the possible reasons why well, we're seeing that. I mean, he only signed his name. His name appears Louis C. Tiffany, I think, Maura could correct me, um, on only two pieces. The other piece is at the Tiffany archives as well. But this is the only piece in Extraordinary that he put artist. So, we know this was some. This was a piece he was very, very proud of. It, one of two pieces of jewelry that were displayed, that were um, published in in the kind of vanity publication, the artwork, and and this was a this was a work of art. This was. I mean, he called this jewelry jewelry art jewelry, artistic jewelry. I don't know whether he even intended these things to be worn. Uh, it, I feel like question midway through. <laughs> Did we know that it was signed artist on the back preceding having it in your hands? No, no, that was a that was quite a revelation when when I first had the opportunity to handle it. It just confirmed everything we, we all knew. Yeah, I mean the, the fact that it's signed, you know, you can see this association. We knew it was in the book. The, yeah, I mean, I can't add to it. It's, it's just so beautiful, the fact that it, it, it was important to him. And as we were uh, discussing the piece internally, the fact that we could you know, open the artwork of Louis C. Tiffany and refer to the piece as we were talking amongst ourselves about the upcoming auction, uh, it, was, it, it was evident to all how important this piece must have been to him and therefore to our history. Absolutely. And then one other thing, just before we leave this magnificent movie. <laughs> the crown. <laughs> um, we talked, you know, about the platinum for the dragonfly, but I'm fascinated by the gold in, in the Medusa. And can you tell us a little bit about that? He, um, he, he used different gold alloys on the piece. And so you can't, well, the back has a lot of different alloys, probably because of extensive repairs. But on the front, um, he alternated the alloy of, of yellow gold, shifting it ever so slightly so that it, it, it does appear to be intentional because every other, I think there's three or, f I think there's three different alloys, but there's six different tendrils. So they would alternate 
to create yet another way to undulate the eye as if these tendrils are moving perhaps underwater. That's great. It's, I mean, and we've seen that in other uh, Tiffany work where the alloy is shifted depending on what stone it's adjacent to or to make the piece more, uh, have, have create more depth. Amazing. Um, so the jewel, uh, here we are, it looks like we're in Europe, we're in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, <laughs> this is the incredible structures, I think the center building, I believe that's the St. Louis Art Museum today, um, but the buildings around it were for exhibition purposes, and this is the 1904 Louisiana Purchase Exhibition. It was publicized you know, internationally as these expositions were, and this is where um, uh, Louis Comfort Tiffany's jewelry was displayed in the Palace of Arts, and it was received rave reviews. One critic wrote, to describe the beauty of these pieces is quite impossible. And we have an interesting piece of ephemera from the catalog, which again shows us, you know, that there it is with the name. None, none of these things we've discussed, a complete mystery. Um, until Christopher and Nani got their hands on it and dove in. It, it, it says carved opal. I guess they re, must have refined the shape of that central stone. What I love is that, that I think any other jeweler would have turned that central stone into an oval. You know, he let it be this free form. I mean, that's it, just like your glass window. I mean, the fact that he allowed the material to be. Well, even, even our moonstone and sapphire necklace that he did a little bit later, he kept the irregular shapes. Mm. They, did, they weren't all matching, and I think most jewelers would have wanted yeah. them to match. Yeah. It's amazing, and um, so these these international exhibitions, I just think it is worth noting, they went on for several months. People came from around the world, and in St. Louis, something like 20 million people came to the exposition. So they were big deals, and um, a lot of people saw the Medusa, for sure, among that crowd, and among them was Henry Walters, who is a, a kind of historical link between the two of you. Again, because he was on the original board, I believe, of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and, of course, a, a very celebrated art collector. But he was also one of Louis Comfort Tiffany's biggest patrons. And he um, did not purchase the piece um, in 1904. We believe he purchased it in 1906. Yeah. And he brought it back. He was originally from Baltimore, but he brought it back to uh, New York where he was in an interesting living situation with the Pembroke Joneses, which the New York Times called uh, this word that I'm going to use now, a thruple. <laughs> <laughs> Christopher. <laughs> Why don't I get the scholarly questions? That's what <laughs> But I think that the audience would like to know, because it's certainly always an important part of, of all art history, and certainly jewelry history, because jewelry is designed to be worn, of, of where this jewel landed and the people that purchased it. So can you okay. just tell us a little bit about <laughs> Mr. I don't, Walters and the Joneses? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that my team would agree that jewelry is designed to always be worn. Okay. But uh, for sure we know that he bought it, right? We, we bought it, he had an incredible collection. And yes, he lived with the uh, Pembroke Joneses in New York and for, for quite a number of years. And A married couple. Well, listen, we, <laughs> I don't know the nature of their relationship. Yeah, that's true. I don't, that's true. But the truth the is, Sotheby's is yeah, the one that broke this open. They did. They <laughs> did. You know, listen. I, I, there's, love is so <laughs> wild. Um, but okay, I will. Okay, no, I will me, advance okay, the let me, thought. Let me. Okay. I would like to say something. Yes, You know, the, the truth is, is the fact that this was accepted at that time. Uh, we know that when Pem died, he married uh, Sarah. Mr. Walters married Sarah. Mr. Walters <laughs> married Sarah. So th there was chemistry, right? And we know that, um, and who are we to judge? <laughs> you know, no like judgment, what no works judgment. for other people. And, and, and the truth is, is that it was 
a dynamic that worked. So it was a dynamic that worked, but also, I mean, I think I, I kind of put you on the spot. You yeah. possibly wanted to say that when Mr. Walters bought it, it was more of an objet. Yeah, that, I think that that's fair to say, but we know that it ended up um, in her hands, and we know that um, it was something that I don't. We don't know that she wore it, but we do know that she treasured it. And the, you know, we look at the style of necklines at the time, and we, we can imagine, we can speculate how it may have been worn. Um, I don't think it was worn the way it was shown at Sotheby's. This but, is the image, I should say, over here. It's the contemporary image with the chain. Yeah, um, that's not the original. That's, that's not, not yeah. original. But well, we don't know. Could, I we, mean, could we think maybe, uh, this is also, um, Sarah, who's also known as Sadie yeah. Jones, who became uh, Mrs. Walters. That is an earlier 19th century image, but it was the only one that we know. And so I also pulled this image from the cover of Vogue, I think it's 1905. So that's around, you can see how the colors kind of align, and it's around the time um, that it was purchased, perhaps in 1906. Yeah. But, um, can we just play out the thought that maybe if she did wear it, how she might have worn it? I did ask Paloma Picasso. Yes. Uh -huh. I had the chance to show her the piece uh, when it was on display um, uh, at the landmark. And of course she responded to the piece because it's magnificent colored gemstones and beautiful gold. And she felt that it would have uh, began at the clavicle and descended. That was what she, and she, she was in love with the piece, loved the center stone. I mean, there's nothing not to love about. I mean, I'm sure, uh, we'll talk about the design. It must have started with that stone. For sure, I'm sure that was the inspiration, that central stone. Yeah. That you look at it and you think, or he did, think jellyfish. Yeah. But I think we can assume, tell me if I'm wrong, that it had to have been worn just because of certain elements the hinges, you know, that, that there were alterations made at yeah. some point during, so the, during or, its life. Or perhaps the second owner. Perhaps the second owner. Yeah. You know, I, I, there's no way to we don't know. know. There's no way. I know the second owner did wear it, mm. uh, or it was worn in the family of the second right. owner. So um, that could have been when, when that took place. I don't know. Uh, but I, you know, speculating about how the piece was worn, I mean, we see other pieces that he designed uh, with Julia Munson with extraordinary chains and extraordinary silk cords and silk cords with semi-precious stones in them and triple cords. And I mean, one can only imagine, but that's not how it was displayed and that's not how it was photographed. Right. So I have to so we also don't... exercise artistic restraint because that's right. not what he wanted. He didn't want it to be worn. Well, it's not how he showed it. It's not how he showed it. He showed it as an object. That's right. Okay. But it, I like jewelry to be worn, obviously. It could it have been worn. It could, it could have been worn by court. And then the family. I would wear it lower. I think it needs to be lower. And I agree with Madame Picasso. I think it wants to start here and, and go lower. I think it's, I think it depends on the size of the wearer, of course. Yeah. So, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, no one knew where this jewel was when it was sold by um, Mrs. Walt, what, who became Mrs. Walters um, in her estate in 1943, and it was purchased by um, um, uh, uh, Zalman Schocken, who of course is a famous uh, figure in the arts, and he gave it to his daughter-in-law, Devora, and it remained in their family until it was sold at Sotheby's in 2021. And um, now we know where you can find it on occasion. <laughs> if it's not in the lab, um, the jewel is on the main floor of the landmark at Tiffany. <laughs> and I, I always love this fact, Christopher, of where you placed it. This is really actually what inspired me to write the story because I, I felt like I understood a message that was being made, it's on the main floor opposite the Tiffany diamond. And to me, that's really the division of uh, Tiffany history. It's always this extraordinary gemology and this exceptional artistry. And I feel you really pointed that out by putting it there. And it tells a beautiful father-son story. You mm -hmm. know? And I think that that 
resonates for us today. I know our clients are delighted to, to see the piece and for sure we still have a lot of work we're, we're, yes. we're considering and discussing and analyzing, but um, it is a wonder to, to behold. Let me ask one more question before I turn it to the audience for questions. You said that it took, you've only gone into one of the, the, the kind of triplets. How long does it take to analyze those triplet stones to really study them? Since well, we can't remove them, so it's all visual. Them. And again, because we had uh, Victoria there, that's why we can't say with absolute certainty because you know you can't really, but we're doing the best we can from observation. But sometimes triplets are made in a very, very sneaky way where it goes all the way around and you can't even see where the division of material is. Um, but that's not the case here. It's really, you know, so we're looking at the center stone, but it's those five uh, sort of pale blue that have this magical fire on the inside. And it's, uh, it was just such a wonderful discovery. Only Tiffany would do that. Right. Amazing. But I will say they have extraordinary tools and equipment at, in, their, in their development center where, and, and an amazing staff. So it was pretty exciting to look at it under those circumstances as well. Uh, clearly, you can see we're doing this together. Yes. You know, this it's, is it's, a, it's, it's a partnership. Yes. You know, and so it's, it's been a really rewarding one. I've learned so much so far. I have too. So, <laughs> so, Thank yeah. you both for sharing it with us. We really appreciate it. And um, I think we can take, I'm not sure who's doing this out in the audience, questions? I'm adrift. <laughs> I saw someone with cards. Is there no one? I'm looking at Bella. <laughs> She's like, I know nothing. <laughs> if anyone has any questions, I can't see you, but I think we could take like two or three. Um, we have no questions from the audience. I think everyone is enthralled by the presentation. There's Jonathan. <laughs> Go right ahead. Right. So the Tiffany document does not list enamel, and enamelist was brought in. The exposition catalog lists enamel. Where is the enamel? Whoa. We have not. <laughs> it, 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 it was described as enamel in the artwork of Louis C. Tiffany, mm -hmm. but in fact, in observing the piece, we, we have not discovered any. An error. It, it is curious because he, in much of the early jewelry that, um, th that he made, enamel was a, was a big part of it. And, and how amazing is it that the color just comes from stones? You know, it would have been, I mean, tempting to, to do that expression with, with enamel, but, but he was able to accomplish it with all those demantoids outstretched into the tendrils. And I mean, demantoids are magical. I mean, I love that. Am I looking at Ben? Hi. <laughs> I've always wanted to ask Nani, um, of the 27 jewels created for the Louisiana Purchase Exhibition, we only know of three or four that are still in existence, but do we actually have images of all the ones that were created? Do we even know what they were? Um, that, that's a good question. We don't have images of all of them. The archives has, has these wonderful photographs, which does, we can match them up with the descriptions in the catalog. And there are some. There are also some publications that that show photographs of them. For example, you, that's how I know about the Qu Queen Anne's lace too. You can actually see the differences in them. But from that original catalog, now that we have this one, that adds one more. Um, there's this one: the grapevine necklace at the Met, the Queen Anne's lace, um, and oh, hold on, am I missing one? Well, there was a necklace that came up that had that um, that I actually have. It, it, it had a lot of condition issues, and I haven't seen it since it's apparently been restored. And and this one, so it's it maybe all of you look in your safe deposit boxes, <laughs> ask your grandmothers, We'd and like if we to can know. get the rest of them, that would be fantastic. I see you. Hi, up there in the top. Uh, I got a question. First of all, congratulations on an amazing talk, and congrats, Vicky, on uh, an incredible discovery here. I feel like this discovery of this opal triplet is really fascinating. Is it possible that other pieces that Louise Comfort uh, has, has created uh, 
Well, it came about because when we were um, observing the piece, what the analysis told us and the visual information didn't line up. And so we knew we had, once it was clean, we could really uh, look at a little bit deeper and, and make that incredible discovery. And what I, I don't think we've ever had another example where we saw that. I, 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 I can't think of one. Typically, a triplet is not something that you do. So uh, well, and I don't think in, in the surviving early early pieces you see anything like that. But you also don't see any any of these large stones, particularly. That's right. Which of course came, you know, from Kunz. So you know, this is Louis C. Tiffany working with George Kunz. Uh, you know, who probably had some beautiful material that inspired pieces like this. May I ask a question? Because I, I, I'm thinking. I'm like, who are you asking? Well, no, I, I think I'm asking you. <laughs> Nani, we're going to hold you all night with this. What would the process have been of the design for this? Uh, oh, that's a really good question, and and I wish I could answer. I mean, this is what we're all trying to wrestle with the design of, of much of his work. In fact, I mean, everybody says it's Louis Tiffany, but. He had an, in, everything was a collaboration. He had an incredible team of designers who were designing lampshades and windows and, and all kinds of things. And, and as I, the pottery, for example, the enamels, all done by, not by Louis Tiffany himself. However, he, he really approved virtually everything. And, and we know that we have a large collection of drawings, design drawings from the Tiffany studios Virtually every one of them has his signature approved by, which, but I, and we, we know there are some windows that he definitely designed, but what makes this so special is it clearly is something that he designed himself. But it had to be in collaboration with a jeweler. He was not a jeweler. <laughs> and, and I think what, what was so thrilling about this was Nani, the Metropolitan, did the work. And we saw it was corundum. We saw yeah. it was very clearly opal, and it was corundum. And when the team and I were there, couldn't make sense of it because it had an agile arrescence to it. Yeah. But we, but it wasn't an opal. It wasn't showing the traits of an opal. When we turned it to the side with the uh, the team from uh, the Jadu, Nani's team, and, and I think to everything Christopher said, it was it was a complete revelation <laughs> because we figured out we saw from the side there was looked like a triplet. And that's when it all sort of came together, because we're like, it's not an oval, it's corundum. It had a blue, very blue, uh, billowy <coughs> shade to it, but it was, he was trying to, I think to your point, what makes sense to me, he was playing with gems the way he was playing with, mm -hmm. with glass. And that was thrilling. I mean, just <laughs> was beyond yeah. thrilling. Yeah. When we, and, and again, it's all, we couldn't take it out, we just saw it, we looked at it, uh, I think through the x-rays and everything else, it just made sense. Um, the whole thing came together and it was, uh, it was, it, was, it was quite extraordinary, so. Very exciting. So it could be, to your point, Dave, it could be. Maybe there are other works of art out there where he's playing well the same way. Mm -hmm. He's playing with this, with gemstones. I mean, it, he's experimental, right? And it goes back to that photo of his parents. You know, you can see the pride in the experimental creative that's their son, you know? And I, I think that's such a, that's why I love that image so much. <laughs> Can we do one more, Jonathan? One more, Jonathan says, and it's you. Thank you. Um, can you tell us more about Tiffany and Company's uh, collection of um, old, well, pieces by Louis Cope for Tiffany? Um, have, have you collected more? Can they be seen? Or do you continue to collect? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes to all. We, we what do you have? <laughs> <laughs> it. It's an amazing collection. Thank you. Well, again, it's an incredible team on the archives. We have an acquisitions team uh, that's here tonight. And uh, thank you guys for coming. And um, we do meet sometimes twice a week. <laughs> but, it, you know, it's so circumstantial. And... For sure, no one saw this coming. And, um, you know, we're in a position where we could at, at that moment, but, you know, timing is everything. And, 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 
yet it's such an important part of who we are as, a, as, a, as an organization to be able to speak to our heritage and to be able to distinguish Louis Tiffany and the work that he did for Tiffany and Company, but also um, recognize the contributions to the 20th century and, and Western art history. I really believe that the Medusa is a work of art. I think it's one of the greatest works of art of the 20th century, I really do. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. It's such a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> we did it. <laughs>